Good evening, I'm Jim Zirin, and this is The Digital Age. Tonight's show is about the new media. In 2005, Arianna Huffington co-founded a political blog called The Huffington Post. The blog was designed to counter Matt Drudge's Drudge Report, which was on the other side of the political spectrum. In the five explosive years that Huffington Post has been in existence, it's become a media powerhouse, an online newspaper, and is seriously challenging the Washington Post and the New York Times for circulation. The question tonight is what accounts for the explosive growth of the Huffing Huffington Post? And our guest will help us answer that question. He is Greg Coleman, who is the president and chief revenue officer of HuffPost, and he knows exactly what there is to know about this new, exciting publication. Greg, welcome to the digital age. Thank you. Now, first, uh, print media. What is the state of print media and, uh, and print journalism in America today? It's in tremendous flux right now, as we all have seen. I grew up in the magazine industry, and at this point, I would not recommend to my children to go into that part of the world, even though I grew up there. I still love magazines. I still read newspapers. But the financial state of the union is just extremely bleak. And everybody is looking at their financial models and trying to refigure out how they can make money, how they can sustain. But advertising revenues and circulation revenues and cost of doing business just are all going in the wrong direction. Is it the economy or is it something else? It's not really the economy. It's the fact that more people are consuming their information via digital means and people are spending their times doing other things. I mean, in my house I have three children all in their 20s, early 20s. My children will, unfortunately, I think, will never read a newspaper and they're pretty clear about it. They're pretty clear about saying, if it does not exist online, uh, it doesn't exist. So they're getting their information from a screen, basically, and that's undercutting uh, the newsstand sales of, uh, of print newspapers. Sure. I mean, a screen, a, a computer screen, they are not consuming news on television. I mean, my oldest son, I watch him, he comes home, he goes on CNN online, scours it, goes to YouTube, finds the clips that he wants to see, goes online, and, and probably is more knowledgeable about the news than most people you'll ever meet. But that's his method. He reads the Huffington Post, I assume. He occasionally reads it. I'd like him to read it a little bit more, but, uh, but my three children certainly do read it. My youngest child, who's a senior at Georgetown, um, reads it frequently. She's always on it, always commenting, always sharing stories. Well, tell us about the Huffington Post. Uh, what has been its course over the last five years and what's going on now? So um, I have been at the Huffington Post for a little over a year. And I want to make sure as we talk about this that I don't, because I can occasionally claim things that I've never done. I didn't start mm -hmm. this great uh, media company. But in the last year, I've had the chance to really watch it and to watch its history understand its history and to try to figure out what the business model should be. So so you hopped on the trolley car and, and where is it going? I got to ride the big white pony. Right. That's that's what I have to... Uh, Better metaphor. It's And it's wonderful. So number one, um, I, in my past I've worked at Yahoo, I've worked at Reader's Digest, some very large um, media companies. I've never had more fun than right now simply because of the explosion of growth and really the fact that we're doing something that no one has ever done. So what Ariana Huffington and Kenny Lehrer... He was the co-founder. He was the co-founder with Ariana. What they created five years ago was a media form that was ridiculed and mocked and I didn't understand it when it first came out as, as well. Um, but the pundits put it down immediately. You know, they just said this thing can't work. And now we're at the now point... Now the pundits are blogging for you. They're, they're <laughs> all blogging, including yourself. <laughs> That's right. Um, so when you do something different, 
when you break the mold, you really have to break the mold. So in the case of the Huffington Post, Ariana and Kenny had this vision to say, can we do things differently than newspapers and magazines? Because they didn't come from there. The Huffington Post could never have been created by somebody that worked for a traditional media company. For one simple reason, everybody's brains get welded together with the way business should be run. And you needed people that had a completely fresh, fresh approach and didn't know any better. Didn't know any better that you could go out and talk to bloggers. So Ariana is really wired. She has so many friends in the entertainment business and political business. The first view of the Huffington Post was to create a blog site and nobody knew what that was then and it was clearly politically motivated back then and today you see with the growth we have 23 verticals going on 24 we're launching HuffPost Health this uh, this week what do you mean by a vertical a vertical means the the variety of different uh, content features so um, entertainment is a vertical comedy is a vertical um, it's a different uh, station on the Huffington Post that we go very deep in and we're so launching very different from a political blog very different so politics right now actually represents around 15 percent of our total editorial content and yet to the average consumer they immediately knee jerk and say Huffington Post equals politics much more accurate a few years ago but now when you're into food and sports and health and other kinds of um, uh, viewpoints um, politics is a smaller piece and yet a very important piece about what we do. Well, you spoke of your explosive growth and how is the growth me uh, measured? Is it uh, measured because of the number of subscribers? I mean, I know you can uh, uh, log in and uh, sign up and you put in a username and password and I guess then you become a subscriber and you get emails and alerts and all sorts of other things. Is that how you measure your growth? So, yes, but we wouldn't use the term subscribers because subscriber usually um, ties a payment of some kind in to somebody that reads the Huffington Post. We are free and we don't ever expect to have a paywall of any kind. So, such as the Wall Street Journal. Such as the Wall Street Journal, and they have been really very successful, probably the only really successful uh, media brand that's been able to charge for a uh, charge in mass for um, for their circulation and for their subscriptions but today we're measured by a research company called Comscore they are the standard in the business Comscore has the Huffington Post today at 25 million unique visitors so 25 million different people come to our site every month a year ago, we were at about 12 million unique visitors. So we have more than doubled in size, and there are lots of reasons why that's happened. Um, so suppose I hit the site every day. I don't count as a unique visitor. You don't. As unique as you are, Jim, you would only count once um, to come onto our well, site. That isn't very fair. <laughs> well, it's b b but it brings frequency, and advertisers look for the number of unique visitors and also how many times they come to the site. So 25 million new visitors a month. Yes. And that's how you'd measure your growth by the number of new visitors. Yes. Unique visitors is really the, the standard. Uh, now, how long does it take to build a brand online? I mean, how do you attract these unique visitors and what motivates them to uh, hit the site? So normally it takes a lot longer than five years to reach the scale that we have. And I believe that in, in looking at this brand, and really I feel like I'm holding on to a rocket because there's no sign, but we're always concerned about growth, no sign of it um, settling down. Um, you have to start with great content. So the Huffington Post is comprised, right now we have about 150 employees. Um, a third of our content comes from our bloggers. And we do read all of the time that people are upset in the media world that we pay our bloggers nothing. We pay our bloggers, like yourself, we give them a voice, and that's really fine for them. We have now about. Now, do you edit your bloggers? 
if uh, suppose a, a blogger submits something do you have an editor there who uh, a gatekeeper who's we gonna have, edit the content yes so we have a blog team that reviews information so if Jesse Ventura has a conspiracy theory which he did we just won't allow him on the site so we're very very careful about what does go up we never edit for opinion but we will edit um, you know just on the on the basis of people having wild radical thoughts that are just not appropriate off for the us spectrum up. off the spectrum and, and people will do that um, and then I think you are probably aware we have created this medium that's more or less a participatory medium where last month we received 3.6 million comments to our stories so these are regular users that will come in that want to speak up whether they're mad as hell and they can't take it anymore or they just have a point of view you are allowed to comment on the Huffington Post and now people what do regularly. kinds of comments uh, would you publish I mean suppose I submitted a comment uh, to an article by uh, Arianna Huffington and I said yes. this is a crock right would you run that so we or will does it have to be more specific w yeah w we will never edit for opinion but we are trying to create a civil discourse with the Huffington Post. So profanity you know, so, uh, are, is completely obliterated through machines. So we have these algorithms that all of the comments have to go through first. Secondly, we have a team of internal people that edit the blogs and will review the comments. Thirdly, and I think most importantly, is that we now have several hundred people that have signed up to earn a badge at the Huffington Post. We deputize people and we give them a badge and they actually human moderate the site. So if you're gonna, if we were at a million and a half comments last year, 3.6 million last month, um, and then if we're gonna be going to five million plus, machines can only do so much. So we, we have a group of readers that love what we do so much that they raise their hand and they say can we help you whitewash your fence and we want to use our time and we love this site don't pay us anything and people earn privileges to be able to edit the Huffington Post. Well badges I mean there's a little bit of the Boy Scouts and a little bit of uh, the Wild West where the marshal deputized uh, someone and gave him a badge now suppose I have a badge what does that entitle me to and what kind of badge do I get? So you have three different levels, all the way up to a pundit, but as you up earn, to a pundit, that's the that's, that's the, the senior top. level. Yeah, so you you could go for a pundit, and it's earned based on how our blog editors watch what you stories you take down, or the comments that you take down, or how you're enhancing the site. You earn different privileges, and even those people we have to keep a very strong eye on because sometimes even a pundit can go off of can go off the spectrum and so we constantly have to moderate our own moderators but so you can be debadged if you go off the you spectrum. can be debadged and you can be taken down but most of it 99.9 percent .9 of these people that love to moderate our site really enjoy um, helping us with civil discourse well That's one aspect of uh, getting a badge uh, is if uh, you link your comments to and, and link the Huffington Post to say Twitter or Facebook. Yes. Uh, now, uh, uh, what does that mean and why does that uh, help you get a badge of honor? Well, uh, it, it <coughs> has to do with activity and it has to do with um, somebody's core competency. But if, if you go and talk about some of the networks, the social networks that we're working with, just as the Huffington Post has grown, we have tremendous relationships with Facebook. We're one of their premier partners with their Facebook Connect. So the number of people that share stories that run in the Huffington Post via Facebook are incredible. The number of people that retweet stories um, is on Twitter. On Twitter is, is astronomical now. We've just done a deal with LinkedIn where they're being integrated into our system. So LinkedIn is kind of a business uh, Facebook. A business Facebook, and they yeah. have about 80 million users that get on um, the, the LinkedIn system. So what, going back to the original question, what um, has happened with the growth of our company, it's been really terrific content, 
and then on top of that, the best use of social tools. So the ability for a friend to read a piece on Twitter, somebody retweets a story, or somebody gets a Facebook Connect, the number of people that will hit that link and ultimately come back to our main site, and they'll snoop around. It's a form of sampling. They'll come there. And we also have- I think have Ariana Huffington has called it the linked economy. She, she, it is the linked economy, and you know, to have the social tools available and to really use them is quite dramatic. So if you take this great content and you take a look at our editors, we have about 75 editors. A big part of their job, of course, is doing what every great editor does, which is kind of coming up with um, very interesting stories and writing pieces and so forth. But our editors do something different that we believe no one else does. Our editors actually are utilizing our technology in real time. So the editors are actually doing their own search engine optimization. We do not have an SEO department. We don't have product managers. The editors are in control of their own destiny and at their fingertips they have some of the most incredible technology that's very seamless, easy to use that allow them to keep track. They get statistics about their stories every hour and it enables them to see what's going on. They have, if you came to our office, you'd feel like you were in a Wall Street trading department because they have these tweet decks up. They're constantly monitoring what's hot. The stories so are hoping living. hoping not trading mortgage-backed securities. Not yet. Not yet. And it's not, not something that we have on the plan. Maybe the wave of the future. But uh, SEOs, a search engine optimization, the term of art that's being used uh, quite a lot uh, in, uh, in the internet space, how does that really work for you? So it's one of our true competitive advantages. So, so the it, Washington Post and the New York Times, uh, for example, online, don't do the same thing? They do not. And you know, the best we can tell, and by the way, the Washington Post, the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, I love all, I read them every single day. Drudge so, Report, do you read that? A little bit. A of little course, bit. I, I have to look at it. Um, what about the Daily Beast and um, the, the, Slam? And, uh, no, the, the, the Daily Beast is something that is not even in our competitive set. And Tina Brown has put together a really great publication, um, but it's just not what we do. We don't compete with them. It's something very, very different. Than so back to SEO, search engine optimization. How yes. does that work? So right now, um, the editors really have the tools in which to look at the stories that they're writing and send messages out into the internet across Google and across Bing where somebody is looking to um, research a bit of information, whether it's on the elections from last night or whether it's what toothbrush they should buy. And we have the best tools that enable us to get our stories ranked very high, particularly in the Google ranking. So many of our stories will appear uh, in the top five listings. So if I put election in uh, uh, 2010 into Google, one of the top uh, hits that I'll get is uh, Huffington Post, Most Ariana assuredly. Huffington uh, writes about uh, yes. what the election means. Yes, but, but it's not just politics, it's across the board. If you did a search on the most beautiful beaches in the world, we're either number one or number two. So having the understanding, so you, when you mentioned the Wall Street Journal or the Washington Post or the New York Times, as best we can tell, they get their statistics of the stories that they're running a couple of weeks after the story runs. What makes us different is we have real time feedback on what's working and what's not working and if stories are starting to spike or if they're starting to flatten out, how we deal with them. So, and then when do we take them down as well? So technology um, is uh, the underbelly of the success of our company. The underbelly, you, underbelly of the success of your company, that's pretty good. It's, it's amazing, but you can't use technology unless you have fabulous editorial. So we could have the world's greatest technology and lousy edit and we're, we would never have moved the needle. So are these professional editors that you have or, or people you train? 
who both just got out of college. No, I mean, you know, you, you have to have gone to one of the top journalism schools in order to come to work for us. You have to have some experience, but then we do train them on these fabulous tech technological tools that we have available. Okay, so we have one-third blogs, we have one-third comment, and then one-third is what, hard news? No, it's it's um, a third uh, blog, a third original content, and a third aggregated content. Aggre now, what and is aggregated content? Aggregated means taking the best of the best from the web. So we swap stories, we constantly are working with uh, People Magazine, with Vanity Fair, with um, all of the different publications to share content to share right. content and to share traffic and that's something that we're very very good at people want to partner with us because we link back to the sites and we throw them tons of traffic uh, and uh, then you also have a hard news component don't you I mean you have a contract with Associated Press we do so you have news feeds all the time do you get it from other hard news from other sources right now Associated Press is the main place and our editors our 75 editors are constantly scouring the world for news but then you also have columnists uh, doing um, in effect hard news uh, I mean Arianna Huffington uh, went to Washington for the John Stewart rally and she wrote that up uh, I mean is that hard news or is that comment well, it's hard news. It's hard so, news. Yeah, and again, that was ignored by the mainstream media, by the way. Uh, yeah. I don't know why, but... Uh, no, well, y you know, we also had a, a very interesting thing happen. Uh, Ariana was on the Jon Stewart show and in the middle of the interview offered free transportation for anybody that wanted to go back and forth from New York to D.C. On a so, bus or a plane? On a bus. <laughs> so we went into the transportation business for a couple of weeks at the Huffington Post. I felt like Ralph Cramden for a little bit from, from the Honeymooners. Um, but again, she has such an amazing sense for timing and publicity. So we actually contracted with 200 buses and we took down over 10,000 people to Washington, D.C. But the public rel relations around it and the soul of the Huffington Post, we like to do good. It, it was fabulous. And I happened to get a couple of sponsors to come along for the ride and help help take care of the costs. Now, what about uh, your business model? It's based on advertising revenue solely, is it not? It is. It's 100% based on advertising right now. And we don't release any specific hard information, but I will tell you that our revenues are up about two and a half times what they were last year. Next year, we're estimating we should double again and hopefully double again the year after that. And that influx of wonderful advertising, many of the Fortune 500 companies are advertising with us, has enabled us to become a profitable company this year, now, and that's a great milestone. Well, you have a low-cost business model, don't you? You have few employees. Uh, you have you don't have the the kind of machinery and equipment that uh, a, a print newspaper might have, for example. You don't have the staff of reporters uh, that they might have. Uh, and certainly uh, running a website, you have to uh, purchase servers or rent servers, but uh, that's low cost. So uh, We do with 150 people and generating our 25 million unique visitors what would take other companies thousands of employees and, tha and, and unions and trucks and those kinds of things. So to be digitally driven with great technology allows us to do a lot with few people and it's it's really one of the bits of magic now remember as we do grow we ha we're going to be increasing the number of people that will work at the Huffington Post so we'll be well over 200 next year well Facebook with 500 million they call them subscribers even though you don't have to pay to go on Facebook uh, it's estimated that they're going to have revenues of 1.5 billion uh, in 2010 uh, do you expect your revenues are going to approach a billion dollars over the next five <laughs> years, your annual revenues? No, I don't, not in the next couple of years, but um, to take a look at the compounding effect of doubling over the next few years, it's, it already is a very meaningful company from the bottom line standpoint, and we expect it to be tremendously profitable. And, you know, what I shared with you at the very beginning is that this is a lot of fun. We're on a, we're, we're creating the path. There's no pathway for us to, for anybody to have done what we're doing. And um, every day is a new day. And 
while everything has been pointed up, not every day is perfect, but days are mostly perfect. And in the media business, that's, that's saying a lot. Let's look at your columnists. Uh, uh, some of your columnists are certainly uh, very well-known figures. Uh, you had uh, uh, people commenting on the election, uh, Paul Begala, uh, uh, Arianna Huffington, others uh, who were household names. Uh, but most of them are uh, really unknown people. It's, it's almost a, uh, uh, a people's site uh, where uh, you've opened up uh, comment to the mass of, of the public. Yeah, I mean, on the home page, you will see most of the people that are blogging for us are people that are well-known in their field. And as you go into the different verticals, we, we, we still, on the home pages of that, we have lots of very important people, people that have something to say, people that you would recognize. That's still going to be a trademark. But we have found some real diamonds in the rough, some really great people that no one's ever heard of before that all of a sudden have created a following. And, and that's part of, again, part of the magic of what we do. Greg Coleman, I have a question for you. What accounts for the explosive growth of the Huffington Post? It's kind of as I said. It's the combination of great editorial, great social tools, and great technology. Editorial, social tools, and technology. Greg Coleman, thank you for coming by. This thank has you. just been terrific. And thank you for coming by. Tune in next week for more on the digital age. For the Digital Age, I'm Jim Zirin. Please visit our website at www.digitalage.org. Good night and all the best.